Welcome to another edition of U.S. Farm Report, brought to you today and each Sunday at the same time by members of the National Farmers Organization in this TV listing area, in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. During the last few months, the National Farmers Organization has made tremendous progress in its efforts to raise and stabilize livestock prices through its livestock marketing arrangements. This same principle of selling together can also be used in dairying and grain to raise and stabilize the price for these commodities. Today's U.S. Farm Report will go into the details of the new grain marketing program recently unveiled by the National Farmers Organization. On today's program are several farmers from eastern Iowa that will discuss the grain marketing program. Leading the discussion will be Ivan Straczynski from Oxford, Iowa. Thank you, Ed certainly is a privilege and a pleasure for me to be sitting with such qualified farmers to discuss the American farm situation. One of its great many problems, of course, being the problem of low farm income. And with us today, we have to better explain and also help the American farmer to better understand the aims and goals of the National Farmers Organization. I'd like to introduce to my right, Mr. Cliff Olson from Cedar Falls, Iowa, Black Hawk County. He's the county chairman who will be giving us details on the grain sales agreements. And to my left, I would like to introduce my colleagues of Mr. Ed Shima from Marengo, Iowa, Iowa County, who will be helping us also explain NFO and its goal. To his left is Mr. Clarence Shookman from Hawkeye, Iowa, Fayette County, who is also the second congressional district of Iowa NFO chairman, and he will be giving us details also of the NFO program. To reiterate a bit, the largest problem we feel as farmers is the low income. What am I speaking of? Uh, what example of in 1920, farmers were selling corn for a dollar and 17 cents a bushel. In 1965, they're selling it on the average of $1.07. In 1920, farmers were selling a bushel of oats for $0.68. Cents. In 1965, they're selling it for an average of $0.65. Cents. In what other segment in America, industry, will you find the producers still selling their commodities for the same prices that they sold them back in the 1920s. We realize, as producers, that this is a problem, and we don't ask for assistance other than those of our fellow farmers. We feel through the NFO Collective Bargaining Program, being a self-help program, we can and are increasing farm income. Basically, I think the problem was probably the most explicitly explained in the March issue of U.S. News and World Report. If present conditions continue and farm income remains the same, there will be a reduction of 65% of the farmers in the Midwest, or 860,000. This is statistics to most of us. However, I think we should emphasize here that we realize just how much is 860,000 farmers. To many people, it's just figures. But if we explain it in this way, that 860,000 farmers would be equivalent to all of the farmers, and I repeat, all of the farmers from the following state. You would take all the farmers out of Missouri, out of the state of South Dakota, out of Iowa, out of Nebraska, out of Minnesota, out of Kansas, 
out of North Dakota and Colorado. You would wipe out all the farmers in the state. This means to the American farmer that three out of five will be starved out of agriculture. To the businessman, the economics would mean that there will be 86,000 less people in business to do business with these farmers that have gone. And to the laboring man, yes, he comes in too. There will be 860,000 fewer farmers out there farming. They'll be in the city looking for work. And they'll be also competing for a job. This is a brief summary of the situation that we as farmers face. And this is why we are bringing you the U.S. Farm Report in order that we can cooperate and through group action increase our income to even a greater extent than we've done up to the present time through marking arrangements and of course the NFO program first being the membership agreement, number two, marking arrangements, and number three, are the master contracts. This is the NFO program. Now, to further explain this, we'll have Ed, if you will, please talk a little bit about the membership agreement, the marking arrangements, and the master contracts. Well, Ivan, before I get into the uh, membership agreement, I uh, run into a little information the other day that uh, was real interesting to me. This is some material from the uh, United Nations. It uh, has quite a lot of signific significance, I think, as far as uh, we as farmers are concerned. Even uh, uh, city people, I think, would have a lot of significance to them. Now, here is uh, what they came up with, this, their little study. Uh, hours to earn this basket of groceries. And there's uh, bread and potatoes, milk and lettuce, eggs and cheese, crackers and meat. Uh, in the United States, it would take one and three-fourths hours of labor to earn this basket of groceries. In Great Britain, three and a half. Australia, five. France, eight. Italy, 13 and a half. Mexico, 14. And in Russia, a whopping 26 percent. 26 hours, rather. Now, what does this mean? I think it means, first of all, that the American farmer has done a real good job of producing food. Uh, the American consumer has to spend less time earning their food than in any other of these countries shown in this study. Uh, almost, uh, even Great Britain, the closest, is uh, almost twice as much time. And uh, now, uh, this has uh, a lot of significance from this point of view, that the farmer doesn't spend too much time in, uh, in uh, the uh, consumer, I should say, doesn't spend too much time in working in order to buy this. So then this releases a lot of her income to spend on the various necessities of life, also the uh, luxury. Uh, as an example, in uh, the United States, it takes uh, about seven-tenths of a, uh, uh, the uh, living standard. In the United States, we have uh, one person, uh, I should say one room, for every seven-tenths of a person. In Russia, it's one and a half, uh, roughly a little over twice as uh, crowded. Uh, in the United States, our phone uh, per person, we have one phone for every two and three-tenths people. In Russia, one for every 54 people. Uh, our churches per person, in the United States, we have uh, one church for every 600 people. In Russia, 20,000 people per church. Just fantastic. Uh, daily newspapers uh, per person um, in the United States, there's 110,000 people for every daily newspaper. In Russia, 8,300,000 people for each daily newspaper. Uh, as far as private farms are concerned, we have 3,700,000 in the United States. Russia has none. Private business in the United States, we have 4,797,000 4, private businesses. Russia has none. This then points out the uh, fact that because of the, the consumer spends a relatively small amount of her time earning the uh, amount of money it takes to buy her food, she then has the rest of this income left over to buy 
these various luxuries. And uh, now what does this mean as far as the farmer's concerned? It means then that he is, uh, here you have one and three fourths hours. Now, surprisingly, the American farmer gets very little uh, of this one and three quarter hours. To be specific, uh, recently the uh, farm has been receiving 38% of the uh, consumer dollar spent for food. The middleman has been getting roughly 62%. Now, what does this figure out to in terms of uh, hours or minutes? It figures out to this. For uh, uh, one and three quarter hours is approximately 105 minutes. Now, of this, the farmer gets 39 and 9 tenths minutes. The uh, middleman gets 65 and 1 tenth minutes. Now, what if the farmer were to uh, get a higher price for his product, a fair price in relationship to the uh, production expenses and so on, uh, what would it amount to to the consumer? Well, as far as uh, we and the NFO are concerned, uh, the amount that we would probably be raising the price to our master contract with the various processors would be about 20% to the farmer. What would this 20% mean to the consumer? It would mean that instead of having to work one and three quarter hours now or one 105 minutes for this basket of groceries, that she would have to work 113 minutes for this same amount under a program of the nature of the NFO. In other words, she'd be working for eight minutes longer. Is this eight right? minutes longer, that's right. In other words, uh, 30, uh, right now she's uh, working 39 and 9 tenths minutes for this basket of groceries, and 20% of that is just a little less than eight minutes. And add that to the, eight, uh, to the 39 9 tenths minutes, and you come up with uh, 47 and 9 tenths minutes, or uh, roughly eight minutes more. So then, we have, ladies and gentlemen, a situation where I think it would be not be out of reason at all for the consumer to uh, expect her to pay the farmer a little bit more. And uh, in doing this, it would help the farm income. It would, uh, the farm income basically is regenerated through the economy uh, roughly seven times. This is pretty well proven by government statistics. And uh, this would do a lot uh, for the economy as a whole. All right, well, thank you, Ed, for those very interesting remarks and certainly the point that you have brought out here certainly needs repeating, and that at the present day, the American consumer is getting his best buy in food ever. In other words, he's spending something like about 19% of his disposable income for food, which certainly is a bargain. And as Ed has pointed out, she would only have to work eight minutes longer to earn a market basket. Now to talk about the primary purpose of our program, the grain program, grain sales agreements. And I know that the farmers viewing this program certainly have a lot of questions. We'll try to cover it generally to help you understand. However, the details, of course, will have to be obtained at your local county meetings. Now, the NFO has unveiled a new grain marketing program. And to lead the discussion on this, we'll have Cliff do this for us. Cliff, how does the present grain sales agreement differ from our previous voluntary sales agreement? Well, I think the main difference in our, uh, this new voluntary grain sales agreement that we have at the present time differs in previous ones be in the fact that there are stipulated selling periods in this agreement. Uh, the first period starts from harvest time through January 15th. And the second one, second selling period, goes from January 16th through March 15th of 1966. And the third one is March 16th through May 15th of 1966. And the fourth period will be May 16th through August 15th of 1966. Now, in previous voluntary grain sales agreement, there was no stipulated time as to when the grain or commodity would be sold. Uh, we always seemed to hold out for that high dollar and we never quite got in the position where we could make this volume sale that we've been seeking. Uh, on these present uh, grain sales agreements, it's stipulated that the grain will definitely be sold within the period in which it has been signed up for. 
And uh, the only time that it would not be sold in this period is in the event that the market price was below the support price. Then this, there is a rider policy that can go along with this, which would uh, prevent the NFO from selling this farmer's grain. Uh, we don't anticipate any situation such as this, but uh, it is just a little bit of insurance that's put in there to protect the man who is eligible to seal his grain. Okay, fine, uh, Cliff. And it seems to me another question at this time comes up is uh, just how many grains uh, does NFO uh, have these sales agreements for? Is it just for corn or just for soybeans or oats or just how many are there, Cliff? Well, there are, there are quite a list of grains. Uh, really in our own local area, we uh, possibly refer to maybe three or four different grains. But uh, throughout the Midwest here in the great grain producing area that we are in, there they include barley, oats, rye, flaxseed, millet, wheat, edible beans, and grain sorghum, soybeans, and both yellow and white corn. So there are quite a variety of grains that are included in these voluntary grain sales agreements. I think that this is very good because in the livestock industry, one of the key things is follows the rule of thumb is when you have cheap grains, it also follows that you also have cheap livestock. In other words, if grain isn't bringing what the farmer feels a fair price, it'll go into the livestock, and first thing we have an overabundance in the livestock industry, and this in turn will bring lower prices. So it is very fitting that NFO, as it always has, is working on all commodities, not only a single commodity. So certainly it goes that this is a good program from the standpoint it's covering very many of the feed grains that in turn determine the livestock producer's income. Now moving on, just how does a farmer go about participating in the NFO grain sales agreements? Uh, of course, you have to be an NFO member. This, this is assumed at this point, but uh, who do I contact? Say, for example, I would like to partake in the grain sales agreement. How do I go about uh, signing up my grain for, to participate in this program of NFO? Well, the most important thing, and uh, first thing the member should do is attend his county meeting. Uh, that is the best place to get first-hand information and uh, only by keeping up to date on which elevators in his own county have signed this agreement to uh, cooperate with the NFO. You're talking of now in great in sales position. Is this That's right. Uh, we have two types of uh, grain sales agreements uh, in the elevator position and uh, on farm position. Now for a long time the NFO has advocated that we farmers should use our farm storage whenever possible. But uh, since there is at harvest time quite often an overflow of grain for the facilities that the farmer has, then he quite normally sells or disposes of some of that grain right at harvest time. And this is where, by placing it into position in these elevators that are participating with the NFO, he can sell his grain in volume simply by, you might say, pooling it together with every other NFO member in the Midwest here who has grain to sell at harvest time and receive the highest dollar or highest price available for that grain on that day in which it is sold. And uh, by so doing, he has, well, really, he has made his volume much bigger by pooling it together with others. In other words, you're increasing your price through volume of sale. That's right. Ivan, uh, I'd like to interrupt here just one second uh, and uh, elaborate just a little bit more on Cliff, what Cliff said there. The um, other uh, real good source of information that we sometimes overlook is the NFO reporter. Uh, if you, as a member, read the NFO reporter real well from cover to cover, you'll uh, know practically all the activities with this NFO, within NFO. 
This particular issue, a recent issue uh, that uh, has the headline, NFO Grain Program Ready to Operate. And if you'll read this article, it'll give you a real good rundown on the grain program and what's involved. Well, thank you, Ed. Certainly this is true. Uh, we also shouldn't overlook that the members of NFO in the grain marketing uh, committee of each county are also explaining this program up and down the road to the farmers and asking them to participate in this program. And certainly we don't have time to go into any great detail. However, since the success of the NFO's marking arrangements in the meat industry have been so successful, in fact, the leading farm publications and leading processors themselves give us credit in the NFO for raising the market uh, four dollars per hundredweight on hogs and two dollars per hundredweight on cattle. Now certainly this proves to be a tidy sum in the Iowa economy, for example. I have here before me a copy of Livestock Slaughter, which is a publication from the United States Department of Agriculture Crop Reporting Board, Washington, D.C. In here they give the live weight of hogs slaughtered in the state of Iowa for the first nine months. This would be January through September. The total live weight of hogs slaughtered in Iowa is 2,739,000 pounds. Multiplying this out by $4 per 100 weight, the NFO marking arrangements have brought in to Iowa $109,585,000. This would be the equivalent of each county in Iowa receiving one industry, one new basic <coughs> industry employing 400 people at the rate of $100 per week. This certainly needs watching, it needs encouragement. If we were to include cattle in this amount, using the conservative figure that the NFO marking arrangements have raised the cattle price $2, this would bring in something like $60 million. Adding these two together for the first nine months, we could project it for the year, which we will, assuming we sell cattle and hogs relatively on the same basis that we have in the past nine months, for the next three months, this would bring in an income into the state of Iowa alone of $212 million. And I just read in the newspaper the other day that the federal feed grains program payments to the state of Iowa have been approximately $215 million. Here the NFO has brought income into the state of Iowa and not a tax dollar has been spent. To explain a little of the meat marking arrangements, we're going to call on Clarence Shuckman to do this for us. Would you give us some of your experience in the meat marking arrangement? Thank you, Ivan. The meat marking arrangement in my area, which is the Northeast Iowa, has been very successful. <clears throat> we found, uh, first, we started with the idea that we would see if farmers together could market together we proved to ourselves and to everyone else that we could. And in this marketing, we got a lot of side benefits, which we did not expect to get. We proved to ourselves by uh, weighing our livestock before we shipped it, that we could send hogs 300 miles and get about a 3% shrink. We were told that we would get much more than this. We uh, also checked at our local prices and find, uh, found out that in doing this, we also made money at the start of this, we, we did not expect to make any money out of this operation in particular, but to prove to the processors that we as farmers could market together. And over, as Ivan just told you, over the whole area, it's worked very successful and has raised the income of all farmers, NFO members, and non-members alike. So I would say it's been very successful, Ivan. Thank you, Clarence. And to Give us a little more background of Clarence's activities in NFO. I'll call on him again, I believe, to just give us a brief uh, description of 
why I belong to NFO. Uh, the reason I belong to NFO is, is real, real simple. Uh, we can go about producing all we want to, increase our production, and things like that. And yet, there's never been a way until the NFO came into existence where we as farmers could do something about controlling the price we receive for our product. As a farmer, uh, I make my living by producing food for people. The only way I can make any money at this is to increase the price of what I sell. And I can do this through the NFO. In uh, other words, Clarence, you're saying that here NFO is offer offering the opportunity to the American farmer to alleviate the age-old problem of low farm income and not have to rely upon tax dollars to solve this while the NFO is interested in supporting stopgap legislation that will help raise farmers' income, or should we say keep it at the level that it is, which is running approximately 77% of parity. In other words, what parity basically means, while it's very confusing at times, it does give you some relationship of your going along with the rest of the industry. In other words, I'm saying that the farmer is receiving about 77% of what he should be for his products in order to relationships to what he buys. In other words, he's buying at 100% and he's selling at 77. This is something in the American economy like a four-cylinder engine that has one spark plug missing. You may go along for a time, however, at some later date it will show up. Well, we feel very strongly and we all are producers. This is one thing unique about the NFO. We are all producers. And a lot of the time that is spent is by dedicated and devoted people taking of their own free time, donating their services, right along with full farm operations. And they are very dedicated to come up with a equitable income for the American farmer through collective bargaining. So in Closing our program, we'd like to say, for those who know, ship and go, NFO. Farmers for a healthy and stable farm economy, join the NFO. Help strengthen farmers' bargaining power by marketing your grain and livestock with your neighbors to the new, modern NFO marketing arrangements that have been set up in your county. Tune in again next Sunday at the same time for another edition of U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relations program, is brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this TV listing area and others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. If you, too, would like to contribute to this worthwhile cause, we would certainly appreciate it. Send your donation, large or small, to U.S. Farm Report Treasurer in care of this station. For more information on the National Farmers Organization, contact the county chapter in your county or write to NFO Corning, Iowa. Farmers, remember, collective bargaining is the key to farmer success. Join the NFO today.